Good morning. As we are gathering, I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church Pendleton and for the opportunity of worshiping with you today. Um, if you are joining us by way of Facebook streaming, we welcome you also to those of you that have gathered here in this place of worship. We especially appreciate <clears throat> your making the effort to be up and about on this uh, warm uh, summer day. I trust that uh, all is well with you and yours. <coughs> As we gather for worship, uh, we want to say to those of you that may be worshiping with us here in person that if you are a guest, we would like to have a record of your presence with us. And each door, front and also, also to your left, uh, there's a visitor's bag that we would like for you to pick up on your way out and share with us some information about yourself and about your family so that we might have that information. I trust that we, uh, as we gather for worship today, we will be uh, very mindful of all the things that God has done to enable us to get here to this place today and to share in this time of worship. As we gather, as we pray together, uh, we want to ask God's blessings upon our gathering, uh, ask God's blessings upon our being here. So I'm going to ask that you would join with me in a prayer as we seek God's presence. Pray with me, please. Holy God, beautiful Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that you will guide us and that you will teach us at every turning of life's way. May your spirit be made known to us May this time of worship today be a guiding element in our lives. In all of life, may we not forget, but remember that we are forever walking in your sight, that we are walking by your sight. And we pray this in the name of our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Together in worship, I do want to call your attention um, to the fact that we will have several changes in the worship guide today um, because, as you may have noticed, uh, our uh, Beloved organist Richard Huss is not here with us this morning. Um, Richard went back into the hospital on Friday and um, is being cared for. So um, if you are not aware of that, um, that's where he is today. And so as we continue in this time of worship and as um, I play other things because I am not an organist. Um, so as I play this call to worship, um, I invite you to lift up prayers for him as well. Uh, for his uh, healing and his quick return to us. And as um, Don Baldwin said to me when we were discussing uh, sound and music and other issues for this morning, um, we will get through the service. We'll get through it. So um, the the titles for several things, um, call to worship and offertory, will be different. And uh, hymns I will lead here from the piano. Um, so just wanted to make you aware of those things as we move through the service. Um, but if you will join me as we continue um, to seek God's presence with us and to lift up prayers for all in our community, um, and certainly including Richard.
That song was Come Just As You Are, Hear the Spirit's Call. I invite you now to take your hymnals and turn with me to number 71 and come into worship as we sing together, Be Thou My Vision. We'll sing all four verses. Would you stand as we sing? This scripture reading comes from Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. I've promised it once and I'll promise it again. I will obey your wonderful laws. I have suffered much, O Lord. Restore my life again, just as you promised. Lord, accept my grateful thanks and teach me your laws. My life constantly hangs in the balance, but I will not stop obeying your law. The wicked have set their traps for me along your path, but I will not turn from your commandments. Your decrees are my treasure. They are truly my heart's delight. I am determined to keep your principles even forever to the very end. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As Chris has has shared, I also ask for you to be praying for our friend Richard as he is in the Greenville Memorial Hospital, praying for discernment with the doctors as they seek to try to find out what to do next for his treatment, and we pray for his comfort and healing. We also won't want to be remembering Pastor Jennifer and her family as they continue to travel and be a part of a time of renewal for this summer. 
Uh, as I mentioned in the newsletter, it's hard to believe that we are already halfway past our uh, time together for this summer, and I truly thank you for your hospitality, for the time shared with you, uh, for the times of study and worship. It has been truly a blessing uh, for me, and I thank you for your faithful support and your presence each and every Sunday. We want to be praying for the church leadership as they move through the summer, continuing to work and do the ministry of the church, uh, praying for those who are in places of leadership, places of responsibility, and asking that God might continue to give us as a church, you as a church, a vision of what it is that we are doing and need to be doing. In his kingdom's work. As we go to God in prayer this morning, I ask that you remember those who have special needs, those who are dealing with uh, choices in life to make, and I pray that you will be guiding in them as well. Pray with me, please. God, today we ask that you would open our eyes open our ears, open our mouths, that we may see, hear, and bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Most of all, our Father, open our minds. Open our minds that we might be able to read your love in every word and deed. Silently now, we wait for you. Ready, my God, thy will to do. Open our minds and illumine us. Spirit divine. Today, our Father, we lift up to you those that have special needs in their lives. Especially we ask that you would be with Richard and Pastor Jennifer. We ask, Father, that you might walk with them through these days and allow them to know of your presence and guidance and safe hand upon them. We ask, our Father, for those who are homebound, those who are worshiping with us by way of Facebook. We pray, Father, that you might comfort them May your Holy Spirit walk in their lives this day. And may we as your people, as we gather here in this place, rejoice in all that you have done for us. We thank you for the teachings concerning prayer. And we thank you for the teachings of the Lord's Prayer that you have modeled for us as your followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good. I see you coming down front to join us, Clarissa. Nobody to play Jesus Loves Me today, but Jesus does still love us, and we're going to have our children's sermon. So if there are any other kids, they can join us. I know um, Isaiah and uh, Aurelia, I think, are watching us from the children's chapel room already. And so hi to them and any other kids that might be watching um, or might watch our recording later. How are you today, Clarissa? Good. And I see your dress even says, Jesus loves me, this I know. Has it written right on there? Well, 
we are going to talk about Jesus' love, and we're going to talk about Jesus' light this morning. So I brought this flashlight. It makes a light. And I want you to pretend for a minute that it was really dark in here. And we needed to use this flashlight to show us where to go. Now, if we wanted to go over there, and it was really dark, and we just had this flashlight, should I shine the flashlight over there, or could I shine it over there? Yeah, I have to show it over there. I have to show it. I have to use it to show our path to get where we're going, right? Well, one of the scriptures that we heard this morning says that um, God's word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. And we can use God's word and God's light to show us the path, to show us where we're going. And a lot of times in the Bible, um, it will talk about our path or the way that we're going, and it uses that to talk about how we live. And so what it's saying is that God's light shows us not just how to get around when it's dark, but God's light shows us how to live, how to live in a way that is healthy and loving and good um, for us and for all the people around us, everybody that we meet. Um, and that reminded me of things that we have been learning in Vacation Bible School on Wednesday nights this summer. And um, so for any of our kids that have been to Vacation Bible School or that might be able to come later in the summer, um, that's what we have been talking about. We've talked about how when things are good, we should shine Jesus' light. We've talked about how when people don't get along, we need to shine Jesus' light. Um, we talked about how when things uh, make us worried, we need to shine Jesus' light. And so the thing that I want you to remember today, and the thing I want all you all to remember today, is that um, no matter what, when things are going well or when things are going hard, um, Jesus is with us to show us how to live, how to be healthy, how to be loving um, to other people. And so just remember that Jesus loves you, and Jesus wants to shine his light for you and for everybody, okay? Let's say a prayer together about that. God, thank you so much for um, the way that you love us and the way that you guide us. Help us to see the light of Jesus and to share that light with others. Thank you for Clarissa and for all the children and families of, of our church and our community. Um, please bless um, Clarissa, and bless all of them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You can go to Children's Chapel. And let me ask you if you would take your hymnals again and then join me in turning to hymn number 482. I'll invite you to stand in body or in spirit as we sing, Here I Am, Lord. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I, who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright.
Would you remain standing, please, for our offertory prayer? Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you for the many blessings in our lives, for being able to be here in your presence, in, in your house, in, in your tabernacle, in your temple. But thanks for the many blessings that we have, our, our homes, our food, our family and friends. The list just goes on and on. Take these offerings that we give of, of self and resources and use them in your will and be with each of us as we go from this place today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today our gospel lesson comes to us from Matthew's gospel, chapter 13. It is one of the parables of Jesus. It is gathered in Matthew's gospel as a cluster of parables as he sought to try to pull together some of the teachings of Jesus in the parable form. We have it in two parts. The first part of the parable is in verses 1 through 9. And in it, Matthew simply shares with us the parable. And then, after a while, he picks back up in verse 18 and shares with us what the parable means. So we're going to look at both of these passages this morning for our guidance and I hope for our nourishment as we seek to understand the teachings of Jesus. 
First of all, reading verses 1 through 9 of chapter 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then, then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they did not have any root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. And then in verse 18 of that same chapter, Matthew picks up and shares with us the interpretation of the parable. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who receives the seed that fell on rocky places is a man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only for a short while. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who receives the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what it was sown. This is the word of God for the people of God. The song that I am going to sing for you today is a newer one for me. We actually learned it a couple of weeks ago at youth camp at Passport. And um, it was a good bit more elaborate than what you will hear with extra singers doing harmony and um, guitars as well as keyboard and percussion and, and all of those things. Um, but... It's a beautiful message with beautiful words that I think are appropriate with the scripture that we have just heard. And so hopefully um, you will be able to hear the message and, um, and I hope you'll like the song as much as I do. one request that would mark all the days I have left I'd rather not be known for treasures and fame 
For trophies and accolades I know will fade Instead I would rather be known By the kindness and love that I show to be known for patience and long suffering, a giver of life by the words that I speak. So, with every breath you give to breathe, I pray it's your glory that they see. Thanks for your music. <clears throat> if you were to travel today to Israel, you would in all probability have an opportunity to visit Galilee, the place where Jesus ministered. And you would in all probability have an opportunity to go out and travel on the lake called Galilee. Some refer to it as the Sea of Galilee, but it's a freshwater lake. Very much like the big water down at Hartwell Badam, if you are familiar with that part of the lake. It will stretch for miles across. The uh, eight mile width of the lake is the narrow side, north and south. 13 miles long, north, excuse me, north to south, but east to west, about eight miles. In the north corner of the lake, you will find a little community called Capernaum. Now, we all know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth, but he lived his adult life in this northern village on the side of Lake Galilee called Capernaum. He lived in a home there. We don't know if he owned it or whether he rented it or whether it was a gift as he was a guest to live there. We do not know. But it is a story that uh, both gospel writers Mark and Matthew share with us. Mark wrote it first. As you know, Mark's gospel was written several years before Matthew. And Mark laid out the story of the parable of the man sowing seed. And then he gave Jesus' interpretation of that parable to his followers. 
Matthew pretty much just copied it word for word. And if you go to a, a synopsis of the Gospels and compare those two readings, you'll find that they are almost identical in language and message. They both felt it was important to share in their writings. Matthew put this in a section of his gospel called the parables of Jesus. And in it we have the parables of the weeds. We have the parable of the mustard seed. We have the parable of the weeds explained. And uh, on and on the parables of the hidden treasure, the parables of the net. These are all parables that Matthew pulled together because he thought these teachings, these messages of Jesus were important to share with his listeners. So here we have the story of Jesus. Uh, the story of Jesus walking out of this Capernaum dwelling and as he would walk down toward the seashore or the lake shore, as it is called, he would travel down a gravel, gravel area and there that's where the boats would be parked on the shore. And so one morning Jesus gets up and he goes down and he's greeting people because they're gathering around and someone perhaps would walk up to him and say, Jesus, tell us a story. Because Jesus was a great storyteller. And he was engaging and he was intriguing and he was interesting and they wanted to hear a story. And so Jesus said, okay, uh, let, me, let me tell you a story. And he knew the language. He knew the way in which the people could hear and understand. And he began to tell them the story of the farmer who went out to sow his seed. Uh, most of you know of my agricultural background. In my pastorate, when I arrived in Hart County, Georgia, I arrived in an area that was rural. It was very rural. Uh, the church was on one side of the road. The cemetery was on the other side of the road. And up here, oh, about 200, 300 yards was another area of an eight-acre tract of land on which the parsonage sat. And uh, that's where we moved into when we went to Hartwell. The house sat way back off the road, and there was a long driveway up to it. And I had only been there about a week. This was in the spring of the year. And one morning, I was finishing up my breakfast, and I looked out the window toward the Highway 29, and there turned into my driveway was a big, huge, four-wheel drive tractor with a big, huge spread of tillers on the back of it that were folded up, barely fitting down my driveway. And that tractor drove all the way into my yard. And so I go out to see what this is all about. And I go out and walk up to the tractor, and a person opens the door, and I recognize him as being Larry Lewis. Larry owned the farm right down behind the parsonage. He and his son Craig had a very large farming operation. And Larry opened the door and he said to me, Preacher, I've come to plow your garden. You are going to have a garden, aren't you? And I said, Well, I guess I am now. So he goes in the backyard in a field of about, oh, three and a half or four acres and makes about four or five swats across that, that area, tills up the land and folds up his plows and off he goes. And I walk back there and I look at this large area of garden and wonder what in the world am I going to do with that now? I proceeded then to drive down to another town and I found a Sears and Roebuck store and I bought a garden tractor. 
So for the next seven years, I was in the gardening business. I was in the business of planting seed, harvesting plants, harvesting vegetables, and it became a very wonderful experience because being a country boy as I was, there was nothing I enjoyed more than smelling fresh plowed ground. I see some head shaking. You know what I'm talking about. There's nothing more enjoyable than smelling fresh plowed ground. So seed planting, sowing, uh, sort of catch my eye when I was a young Bible student and as I was looking at the parables of Jesus, this parable came to me in such a way that I was able to understand it. But what about Jesus' story? So he tells the story. There was a farmer who went out to sow his seed. And he just broadcast it up and down the road, the area, the field. And noticing how it fell, we have the capturing of that very clearly here in Matthew's rendering of the parable of the sower. As he goes out to scatter the seed, some fell along the path. We know a path is well trodden, the ground's hard, it's probably not going to take the seed very well. It becomes a nesting place for birds to come along and eat the seed before it can germinate. So that's exactly what happened. The birds came and ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. Rocky ground, as you know, is hard to till and it's hard to grow anything in it. It's hard to get a plow through it. So it's not very good for growing plants. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they did not have any root. Could not get any rootage in the rocky soil. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Weeds. Weeds are a farmer's worst nightmare. Weeds are difficult to control. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop. 160 or 30 times what it was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. So that's basically the story that we have of Jesus' story of the man who went out and sowed seed. William Willimon, who, was one, who is one of my favorite contemporary preachers, spent many years at Duke University as the chaplain at the chapel of Duke, now served as a bishop in the Methodist church. He writes, Jesus explained God with unexplainable stories. That's his take on it. Jesus explained God with unexplainable stories, most of which lack neat endings. Most of them end with a twist, he says. Something unexpected happens at the end. God is met in the stuff of life, in the stuff of daily life, in the tug and pull of the ordinary. Not always clear, he says, but don't fret about it because the disciples didn't get it either. So he says, Jesus' is teaching and preaching in parables is not easy for us sometimes to understand. You and I, we tell stories. I told you about my story of getting the gift of my garden. You can identify with the elements of that as you seek to try to get yourself into the story. So yes, we have 
the gift of the telling of the story. Jesus was that, a good storyteller. He meant to uncover the deep, real truths about the world. Jesus' stories must have a good beginning, must have a good middle, and must have a good ending. But yet, at the same time, Jesus' parables tend not to explain everything. Jesus not only spoke in parables in that way, but Jesus is a parable in himself. Now, back to our passage in verse 18, uh, we find here that uh, Luke seeks to share with us, okay, now Jesus is going to tell us what the parable means. So there won't be any misunderstanding. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. When a person is confronted with God himself and they seek to try to understand God himself, and the kingdom of what it means and understands. However, Satan has a way of coming in and snatching away what was in his heart. This is the seed that is sown on the path. The one who receives the seed that fell on the rocky places is the man who hears the word at once and receives it with joy, but soon he has no root he lacks only a sh- he lasts only a short time. Back in my sermon barrel somewhere, uh, there is a sermon of mine entitled "Bubbles and Fizz," and this was my passage of scripture for that sermon about what happens in a person's life when all of a sudden they get so excited about what God is doing and what God has done, and they become just bubbles and bubbles of joy, and their lives are just consumed. But then without any deep rooting or deep study or giving themselves to worship, all of a sudden that bubbling turns to fizz. And before you know it, it dissipates. People who seek to live on this roller coaster ride of their faith, a mountaintop experiences and then walking in the valleys. Mountaintop experiences, walking in the valleys. That is not God's plan for his children. That is not God's wishes for those of us who seek to try to follow him. Why is it? that there is so much goodness? Why is it so much is produced in people's lives? So productive. Some people have lives that are filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. A hundred tomatoes of love. Here we find patience, happiness. Others, seemingly nothing. Seemingly no productivity at all. There is, I think, a context of false teaching in this parable. The face bath, if you're a Christian, some would say, if you have a Faith in Christ, you have a better everything. You have a better family. You have a better vocation. You have better kids. Everything you have, more wealth, more health, all of that is yours simply because you are following Christ. We have learned to be able to discern that that seeks to be what is in the category of the prosperity gospel of today. 
that would teach you that this is what happens if you would just simply follow Christ. Everything in your life is going to be hunky-dory. Appearances sometimes are an illusion, aren't they? Now take that big tree in the backyard here at your church. You'd walk back there and you see a big stump that's got a circle of just a little bit of life to it, but in the middle of it there's this huge decay and this huge, huge dead area. That 60, 70, 80 foot tree stood there in the yard for whoa these many years and you believing it's safe. It looks good, has leaves on it, there's not much dead wood on it. But then all of a sudden a storm comes by and blows off a chunk of it and that was a wake up call. Say, so wait a minute, we need to inspect that tree further. We need to take note of that. Because that can be dangerous. And so the tree removers came in and cut the tree down. And lo and behold, there was very little life remaining in that tree. It looked good. It had plenty of leaves. It had a nice canopy. Appearances are deceiving. And we need to take note of that as a teaching principle, I think, here in the Gospel of Matthew. But the one who receives seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what it was sown. Jesus did not always go to length to try to explain a story that he told. The power of the parable is to tell the story and allow the listener to interpret it, to allow the listener to climb inside of it and look around and where do I see myself in this story? Where do I see my understanding in this story? Once upon a time, Jesus walked out of his house in Capernaum and he walked down to the lake and he sat in a boat and he told a story. Once upon a time, there was a farmer who had some seed. Now, go home and think about it. Go home and think about it. Think about what I may understand it to mean about my life. And they all went home and they thought about it. You and I will go out from here and I trust that we too will think about it. Thanks be to God for the revelation of himself to us. We now have a time of response. Uh, the hymn is number 497, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Um, I'd like us to sing the first and the third verse. So uh, verses one and three of I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. As you sing, um, if, there are, uh, if there is anything, any decisions that you feel led to make that you want to share with the church, or if you desire prayer, Pastor Dan will be at the front and will be happy to receive you. Um, uh, so we do invite you to come forward during this um, or to simply um, 
make those decisions and share them with God as you sing um, from your place. But if you would please stand and join us for hymn number 497, the first and the third verse. decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Do you have just a couple of announcements to share with you this morning? Um, and Don, I think I'll just do that from here. Um, if you check, of course, the announcements are in the insert in your bulletin, but there are a few things that I want to draw your attention to. Um, one is that we have a quarterly church conference coming up at the end of this month. Um, so that will be Sunday, July 30th. Following worship, we'll have lunch in the fellowship hall. Um, the church will provide chicken, and we ask if you can uh, bring a side dish or a dessert to share. That will be wonderful. Um, of course, as always, uh, if you don't have opportunity to bring something, that's okay. Come anyway. Um, there will be plenty of food, as there always is. Um, that does mean um, committee leaders, committee chairs. Uh, we do need, uh, if you want to submit a written report so that you don't have to um, verbally report everything at that church conference, um, please get those written reports into the church office by Thursday, June 27th. Um, that also means um, if you are part of church council, so committee chairs, we do have a church council meeting that will be a week from tomorrow. So not this month, not not tomorrow, but Monday, July 24th at 6 p.m. We'll have that church council meeting so that we can be ready for the church conference on July 30th. Um, otherwise, I wanted to let you know that our financial secretary, Becky Westmoreland, is on vacation this week. They have gone to, um, to Disney World, uh, so they will be out of town this week, uh, just to let you know that. And otherwise, we'll have normal Wednesday night activities this week. Um, so adult Bible study will be with Dan, um, continuing to... Um, do the study, being a disciple community, loving God and neighbor. Um, youth will be with me, and our vacation Bible school for children will continue um, as well as they um, continue to do the uh, the theme stellar, shine Jesus light. I think that is all that I wanted to bring to your attention. Are there other announcements, um, Dan or anybody, that we need to let people know about? Well, then I will turn it back over to Dan for our benediction. I pray that we will be listening to hear God teach us, that we might be able to hear the Word of God as it comes to us, and that we might be able to apply it to our own needs. May we become sowers of seed for the kingdom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord to cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forever. Amen.